All right, I'll turn it over to you, Karen. Okay, thank you and welcome everybody. It's so nice to see such a great turnout um, after such a beautiful spring day. Um, a few announcements though, before we get started, uh, we have a lot coming up this spring. Um, on April 6th, we have our next Drawing Birds program with uh, Karen Sieg. Um, and you can find information on all of this on our website. Drawing Birds is going to be the Goldfinch and uh, that will be April 6th. We have some field trips coming up. On March 26th is a um, field trip to Shyocton to view tundra swans. And on April 16th, it's Sunrise on the Buena Vista, which is always a beautiful field trip. Both of those are gonna be great. Again, look for meeting times and places on our website. One exciting uh, thing coming up, our April and May programs are most likely going to be in person at the Lincoln Center at 7 p.m. Um, <clears throat> on, uh, that's April 20th with Janet and Amber Eschenbach on Kestrels and May 18th with Dan Jackson on da damselflies and dragonflies. Um, so again, uh, those will be at 7 p.m. at the Lincoln Center. If it's fairly likely things may change. So just again, look at the website and we'll try to keep that um, updated. Because we're going to have live programs, hopefully in April and May, we could use an audiovisual person to volunteer to record those programs um, if you're interested in helping us out with that, um, please contact us at, uh, through the website, send us an email or give me a call and um, we'll um, get you set up to help us out with that. We could also use some volunteers for our junior Audubon programs. Those are going to be at Schmeekly Reserve. Um, those are April 23rd, May 7th, and May 28th. So if you wanna come and work with some uh, children and families, uh, we could use an extra hand or two leading hikes or helping with some of the other activities that we have set up for kids that day. With that, um, I'm going to turn the introduction of tonight's program over to Nancy Stevenson. And we pre-recorded that, so just give me a moment to um, share my screen and hello everyone and welcome i'm nancy stevenson emeritus board member of aldo leopold audubon tonight's program is presented by jerry jams one of our own as you will see are an example of his skill as a photographer and many more of his pictures are included in Alan Haney's book Jewels of Nature. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. I first met Jerry many years ago when we both served on the board of Aldo Leopold Audubon and I was impressed with his dedication to our mission and his involvement in chapter activities. He has capably served several terms as an officer, committee chair, and field trip leader, and his involvement continues. In addition to chapter commitments, Jerry assists with Kestrel research in the Buena Vista grasslands. He frequently leads field trips for WSO and other organizations, and he and I share leadership responsibilities at the clearing for the week-long spring birds class every May. During his career as an electrician, Jerry's schedule, the early morning shift, allowed him frequent opportunities for spare time birding, which he pursued with a passion on an almost daily basis for the past 40 years. It is always fun to be with Jerry on a field trip. He not only can identify birds by sight and by sound, but he is an astute observer of bird behavior. He knows their molts and plumages, their migration patterns, their habitat requirements, and he knows where to find them. 
He keeps scrupulous records, always sharing his observations and adding to Wisconsin's cumulative knowledge of avian occurrence and abundance. He is one of the finest field ornithologists I have ever known. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce this outstanding birder naturalist and my very good friend, Jerry Jans. And with that, Jerry, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of taken aback with a lovely introduction um, from a very good friend of mine and someone who I've uh, held in the highest esteem uh, for years and years, as long as I've known her. She's an amazing person, a great mentor, and I thank her for the introduction. Um, she kind of overrates my skills a little bit. I, I think I, I look at myself as kind of a uh, an advanced beginner, and uh, I think most of us are beginners. We're always learning. And uh, that's kind of what I brought into this talk tonight. Uh, about a year ago, uh, the program committee asked if I would be able to do a presentation about birds or birding in Portage County. And after I agreed to take on the project, I realized I really had no idea where to start or where I wanted to end up. Uh, it was pretty open-ended, which they made clear to me I could do what I wanted. Uh, for me, bird watching, like anything else, is something that you do where you happen to be. And most the time for me at least the place is somewhere in Portage County. I've always found birds to be pretty interesting wherever I found them and I started wondering if there was anything particular unique about the birds and birding in this place in Portage County. Any reason that it might stand out. They just turned on captions I asked oh, them to. Oh, you're done. And, and, that, and that has led me to uh, an investigation of birding here. I came up with with three reasons why I feel that the uh, Birding here is, is pretty good. Uh, it's very diverse and we have great opportunities in Portage County. Um, but as I investigated, the first thing I started with was taking a look at the county itself. And look, it's not- Like you might mention some areas. Mm -hmm. uh, no. <laughs> I have, it's nothing outstanding you know, sidewise. You know, you look at, you look at Wood County, Portage County, you could cut Marathon County in half and, and here we are. Um, it's in the middle of the state. It doesn't have a great lake, doesn't have a great river. It, it's just perched here. And I thought, well, you know what? That's not a bad thing uh, for birders. If you look around the state, you start recognizing where all these super hot spots are and then we're right central. So maybe that's one of the good things about it. Then you go a couple hundred miles, you take yourself to Duluth Superior. Yeah, wintertime, you get Bohemian wax winds and uh, pine grow speaks. You go to Wisconsin Point in the fall and you can see Harris's sparrows, maybe a Savin's gull. Uh, Maybe you're lucky and a, and a jeer falcon flies over the harbor. There's a lot going on up there. It's not that far. If you stick your nose a little farther up, you wind up in Saxon and Bog. And you can see great gray owls and northern honk owls, blackback woodpeckers, maybe a northern goshawk. Incredible birding, very close. You don't have to go that far. You can go to Three Lakes over by Alvin, just up the road 100 miles. And more great northern birds, boreal chickadees, uh, Canada jays. This happened to be a white wing cross, but with those red cross bills, a lot of winter finches, purple finches. You can drive up to Alvin at their bird feeders and watch evening gross beaks. Closer yet, Horicon Marsh, great hotspot, world renowned wetland. Uh, you can go down there and find great shorebirds, which is something we don't have a lot of in Portage County, but you can find American avocets, black net stilts. Uh, it's a good place to see whooping cranes, Forester's Turns, uh, beautiful marsh, lots of waterfall, it's only 80 miles. Swing over towards uh, Sheboygan and the Milwaukee Lakefront. Go there in the winter time. You can find probably all three species of scoter uh, through the fall and winter. This happens to be a white wing scoter, but there's surf scoters and uh, black scoters. Sometimes they have western greaves. Uh, lots of lots of long-tailed ducks, red-breasted mergansers. A great great hotspot. Not far from Portage County. Straight down to Goose Pond. We've gone there a lot with Audubon. There's greater white-fronted geese. Uh, right now, there's snow geese, Ross's geese. Uh, later on in the summer, you might run in the fall, you may run into an eared grief, a rare Western rarity. You go there in the summertime and poke around the cattails and look for uh, least bitters. Another great spot right off the hub, Wyalusing State Park, 130 miles. And you wind up with a lot of really great neotropical migrants down here by the river bottoms by for planetary warblers. There's hooded warblers in the understory. 
cerulean warblers are nesting right in the campgrounds. There's Bell's Vireos. There's some of the blown out areas, sandy spots. There's lark sparrows, um, yellow-throated vireos, yellow-throated warblers. It's 130 miles, so it looks pretty good to be right here. You can go over to Brownsville, Minnesota and see tundra swans. They're there right now, thousands of them. You see white pelicans. We arrived, we've gone over there with Audubon. You've seen all kinds of puddle ducks, great waterfowl, close-up close looks. Almost every canvas bag that comes down the Mississippi Flyway makes a turn here and heads for Chesapeake Bay along with the tundra swans. So it's an excellent spot. But I started thinking about that and just being close to all these other great hotspots and being a central hub doesn't make where you are necessarily a good place to find birds. And I have a feeling that this is a good place. It sure seems to be. And one of the reasons for that is that all the bird species that I've just mentioned and all the photos, almost all the photos I've taken, were taken here in Portage County. So I get the sense that this is a pretty good spot, but I need to do a little more digging. I had to look why, what makes it special? When we looked at the other map, it's just sitting there in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and I do have to add a caveat quickly before I go up. If, if you uh, would like to see some of the special birds that I showed you, like a great gray owl, uh, you'd be better off to take a well-planned field trip. You could wait a long time, I think, before another one shows up here, but it could happen next year. I don't know. These are the sources I went to to get some numbers to back up some of my feelings I had that this is a, a good spot. I needed, I needed to go to the records. Uh, one of the good ones right now is to go to eBird. It's very easy to search. You just go online. You don't even need to create an account. I, I encourage everyone to do that and to enter your, your uh, sightings and follow it. There's so much information here and it's, it's so easy to navigate it, to look for things. So I use this to look for what birds are found in the county. But realizing that Ebert didn't start until 2002, I knew I had to look elsewhere. And I turned to the Birds of Portage County by Murray Berner. A lot of you probably remember Murray. Uh, kind of, I hate to say that, but he's kind of the dean of Portage County Birds. He was a student uh, of, of the birds here. He, he followed up on sightings. He did his own sightings, mostly from bicycle for years and years. He's a very careful birder. And knowing that not everything uh, for the Portage County record is in eBird. He took what was current at that time before he wrote this article for the, the uh, passenger pigeon of the Wisconsin Society of Ornithology in 2011. He took all the current eBird sightings and then he interviewed all the birders he could think of and that he knew in the county or knew of people in the county who birded here, who knew of other people's records. And he pulled them all together. Uh, as I said, he's a very careful birder and he uses his own filters to figure out what were good records and what weren't. He put this, this uh, volume together, this, this article together. And it's archived now. If you go to WSO's website and look up their passenger pigeon volumes, you can find this volume from volume 73, number four from 2011. Excellent piece to read. So with these two together, put me into Portage County. I also went to Sam Robbins' book, which is an excellent source of the uh, maps, the field guide maps of range maps and and the species descriptions in there are so good, uh, so well done the past histories and up to date and, and a lot of the history of birding in Wisconsin. So I recommend everybody look at it, but I mainly went to it to look at the breeding ranges of the birds that are found in the state. And then I also use this book, The Breeding Birds of Wisconsin. This is the first Atlas project. The book came out in 2006, it's a little dated. Uh, the new Atlas II project has just recently been completed, and they're in the process right now of putting the book together. It'll be a little while. You can do some data mining of the, of the uh, information from eBird, but really the numbers look like they're going to come out about the same. So the maps in here of breeding birds and their ranges in Wisconsin were very good, and I was amazed and, and, and pleased at how much they overlap and they matched up with uh, Sam Robbins' book, which I think was in 91 he wrote it. So what did I find? Well, we, we realized this geographically, but Portage County is 29th out of our 72 counties. Uh, but it has, it's 18th in the number of species recorded at 308. And that was from eBird in January 22 of this year. And that's current stuff. Uh, there are 454 recorded species in Wisconsin, according to eBird. So if you take you know, the 308 and the 454 in my crummy map, uh, that's about 67% of all the birds that have been seen in the state have been seen in Portage County. Um, right now, it looks like we're gonna have 226 confirmed breeding birds in the state, total state, 
according to Atlas II, and uh, using Murray's numbers, which are very good. And, you know, they change. There's some that are here now that weren't there then, but it's a good rough ballpark figure, which is all I'm looking for. He came up with 166 breeding species in Portage County. So 226 total confirmed for the state, 166 for Portage County, almost 75% of all the birds, Wisconsin's breeding birds, there are records for um, either now or in the past in Portage County. So something's, something's going on here. Something's creating this, this great uh, place in the center of the state. Um, and so I dug some more and I found this map. And I really, I, I really like this map. There's no lines on it. It's obviously where two things are coming together with a border, a big broad border that's swirled across the state. And it's, it's pretty neat. Um, and most of you or any of you who have had uh, plant taxonomy classes or plant ecology classes, either at Point or somewhere else, probably recognize this right away as a map of the tension zone. This, this map was created, I found it on the uh, Climate Tension Zone in Wisconsin article by Swiss Audubon Center. It's a good map. And what's going on? Well, we've got a forest type, actually an ecological plant-based type of forest, meaning northern music forest, cooler, wetter, and it runs into the prairie and dry deciduous forest here. And of course, there's an overlap, kind of a mushy overlap. The two things blend together right here. This would this be oak savanna and prairie, and this is a dry deciduous forest that you find as you go into Indiana and Ohio. The, the tension zone itself was first recognized and described that I could find by a Michigan botanist, Edward Linkston, who called it a zone of tension. And I really like the way the old uh, botanists and some of the old scientists, their language, because he talked about the tension. The tension was caused by the movement of plant societies advancing and pushing back. And I just, I like that concept of a plant society. It, it kind of dignifies it. Um, and in 1951, John Curtis and Robert McIntosh, after doing sampling across the state for the, uh, the botanical and uh, composition of the state, uh, set the location of Wisconsin tension zone based on a higher than expected number of plant species found in this area. And it's all about climate. Climate is, is controlling where these forests are. And because it's about climate, it's a dynamic border. It's moving. It's living border. It changes all the time. There's no, there's no set place where you can say, now I'm here and now I'm there. Um, and John Curtis himself talked about, and this is another, another great, great uh, sentence out of his book, that there's no clearly defined subdivision, but a definite gradient. And I, I like the thought of a definite gradient. So it, it's always changing. And of course, the, the diversity of the plant community is going to lead the diversity of the bird life. And you can see us now in Portage County, we're right in the center of it. Now, this, is, this is the transition area. We've got Northern Forest here. Down in this corner is where the dry forest comes in. And we do have some grassland and stuff, but technically that's still transition. And the green here, which is showing the Northern music for it actually probably curves a little bit more down in this corner. Uh, what does it do for us as far as birds? Uh, a couple of neat, neat statements. One's really a wordy one to tell you the difference between older uh, naturalists and the new, new people. This is a sentence that came out of the Atlas of Breeding Birds of Wisconsin the central location and wide geographic extent of the forest transition ecological landscape are reflected in a rich diversity of bird species. This next part is really important, but few of these are uniquely concentrated in this region. So there aren't birds in Portage County that you can't find other places in the state. There's nothing really special here. With one exception we'll talk about later, there's, there's one bird that, that's pretty, pretty much localized here. But for the other part, it's not that the species we have here are unique, it's that they're all here. That's what the tension zone does for us. It's this overlap, it's this blending of this border. And Murray Burner in his article wrote, the tension zone encompasses most of the county and its influence on regional bird life is significant. And significant indeed. We have to go to another source. I might ask you about this and to watch his head is hilarious.
all the stuff going on below in his eyes, his head never moves. Um, it's, of course, a drumming rope girls. Don't worry if you can't hear it too well. This was taken through a spotting scope, and uh, the, the uh, microphone is quite a long ways away. So, okay, what does the what does grouse have to do with this? Well, I was surprised when I was doing my research at how many times people would talk about the uh, a rough drumming rough grouse or the presence of a rough grouse as an even indicator that you were in the northern forest. And we have plenty of those indicators in the county, and we should because if you notice this top part. Of Portage County, this is northern music forest, and it kind of rolls down. And this is a forest transition, the tension zone. We've got some influence here from drier and warmer um, uh, climate coming up. And remember, this is climate driven, so now we're, we're not really sure as, as climate change comes in how that's going to move. But it's interesting because it's, it is a dynamic border, so it is going to move, and it probably always has moved. So we have rough grouse as an indicator, and there, there's lots of other ones, as I mentioned. So what are we looking for when we're looking at the tension zone? Uh, at first, I thought possibly uh, common loons and maybe a common raven. Common loons are, are, seem to be moving into the county. When I was uh, birding in the 70s, I don't know of any in Portage County that were nesting. I grew up in Marathon County, and we had some, but not very many. And, and ravens were the same way. Ravens were unusual to find. What I think is going on, though, in, in the case with these birds, is they're like bald eagles and ospreys. They're becoming much more tolerant uh, of our presence. Uh, and the, the range, the historic range, as far as we could tell, of the common loon went all the way down to southern Illinois. Uh, they moved out as Europeans moved in, and the same thing with ravens. And I think what's happening now with the loons especially is we're giving them a little more space, perhaps, recognizing what their needs are. Uh, some of the water quality has improved on the lakes, and they're moving back down. Uh, the ravens, I think, have just figured out how to live with us, which is what uh, bald eagles did and what ospreys did. This became more tolerant of our presence. So I don't know that they're really good indicators of tension zone. But this bird definitely. Not the buzzy one at the end, uh, the first one. This is a winter wren. This is another classic, classic Northwoods bird, um, and they and they nest here. They uh, they nest um, in Mead Conifer Bog in Four Oaks Marsh, uh, the, up north from me, not too far into Dewey Marsh. Uh, you can find them breeding over in the Tomorrow River hunting and fishing grounds, over towards uh, Little Wolf River fisheries areas, all northern areas, and that's kind of where you would expect them. But you know, it, it's a uh, it's right on the edge of their range. It's fun to look at their at their breeding range and their where everybody else sees them. We are at the southern limits of, of the range of this bird, and also of this bird. It's not unusual to flush hermit thrushes. This is a hermit thrush. You can tell by the nice red tail. It's not unusual to flush hermit thrushes anywhere in the county during migration. This bird was probably a couple of miles north of my house. Flushed it up in Dewey Marsh. It's got a beak full of nesting material. This bird is nesting there. And once again, we're on the southern edge of their breeding range in the county. Uh, they breed, uh, my wife and I, one of the sections when we did the second breeding bird atlas project, one of our blocks was a meat conifer block. And in June, there was six to eight of these birds singing on territory, nesting there. And they, uh, like I said, this bird is in Dewey Marsh. They also nest across that whole northern part of the county. Here's another great northern bird. This is a, a Lincoln Sparrow. This is right off Oakwood Road in Dewey Marsh. You see him in the Tamaracks. It's kind of a northern bog specialist. Uh, once again, follows the breeding range follows very closely. Uh, these birds are singing and they're nesting in Dewey Marsh. We are, we are lucky that they're here because we are, once again, at the southern edge of the breeding range. Same thing with the white throated sparrows, which you can hear singing on Torrin Road. You can hear singing in Polonia. Um, they're here. They breed here. Another northern bird, a uh, classic northern bird. Couple more, even better ones, the blue headed vireo and the uh, yellow, yellow bellied sapsucker, which um, has a great line. His line, their, their nest, their breeding line, uh, uh, their, uh, their territory line uh, range map follows that S curve of the tension zone very, very well. A couple more birds, we have some northern raptors, broad winged hawks. And sharp shinned hawks, broad wings, you don't really think too much about being northern nester, but, but really, if you look at the range maps, that's where they are. And we take it for granted that we see them regularly, even into the summer months. Sharp shinned hawks, not so much because they're quiet when they're nesting. Both these birds are probably 
quarter of a mile apart up in the Dick Camp Fisheries area. Uh, Sharpshins nest there, they nest over in Four Oaks and different areas across the county over in uh, the, the uh, and like I said, Dick Camp Fisheries area up behind like Lowell Classics area off River Road. Some other good birds indicated northern birds that I guess I've always been surprised to find uh, yellow rump myrtle warblers, Canada warblers, and Paul Northern or the uh, Eastern Palm Warbler all nest in the county. A lot of these in the conifer bog. I've seen them, I've seen adults feeding fledglings and once again off Oakwood Road and Dewey Marsh just north of my house. My wife and I were on a green circle trail on the uh, River Pine segment. We watched an adult yellow rump warbler feeding fledglings. Uh, Canada warblers can be found in Dewey Marsh off Torn Road. Uh, black throated green warblers, same thing, same parts of the, of the county up in the northeastern parts along the river, Smile River, Poncho Creek. Nashville warblers in the bogs regularly, Dewey Marsh and Mead Conifer bog, but just not far from my house now on the Green Circle Trail on the Moses Creek segment, uh, we've had them singing all summer uh, on territory breeding back in the swamps on Moses Creek. And bringing warblers brings us to another zone. I know we're probably talking about zones, but it's one of the reasons that we are in the center of a zone of hybridization is because we are in the center of the tension zone. And it has to do with these two birds. They look very distinct. The, the one on the left here being golden winged warbler and the blue winged warbler look very different, very different, but looks are very deceiving. Um, they actually share 99.97% of their genetic. Uh, the only little bit of difference is controls their throat color. Um, the golden winged warbler is a northern bird. This, this map I created off of the uh, breeding bird atlas. I'm not sure about this anomaly here that maybe should be made through, but it's nice because this blue winged warbler's range map otherwise follows the tension zone line to a T. Uh, golden winged warbler is a northern bird. Blue wings are moving up. They're moving north and here, of course, to Portage County. And this is the zone of hybridization all along with the grays. They rapid, they readily hybridize. Um, and because the blue wing, I think, is moving up into the state, there's some concern about the golden wing warbler. It's now a, a species of special concern. It was an attempt to put it on the endangered species list, which failed. They both like uh, a certain, uh, they're like the Kirtland warbler, they need a certain stage of succession. And so where these 40 acre or 20 acre smaller clear cuts are done for wildlife management. These guys do good in a couple of years. They like the brushy areas that go in. I think pre-European settlement, it was uh, wind throws and fires and disease areas that would create these openings. And they would take advantage of them. But right now with the blue wing moving in and, and with the overlap, the problem comes in when you look at how close this genetic material is, do we really have two birds here? So when you try to get one of them listed as endangered, it can be a problem. This is what the hybrids look like. These were both taken in Dewey Marsh. These are Brewster's warblers. Uh, you can see the yellow cap only left, but the black throat is gone from the golden wing, but there's the golden wing, the second and the white, uh, excuse me, the yellow lesser culvert. And here again, too, you still have the yellow wing bars and a little wash of yellow across the breast. There's also a Brewster, or a, a Lawrence's warbler, which has a, has a brilliant bird, black throat. It's got the black markings but the deep yellow chest, the black markings of the golden wing, the yellow chest. And it's a back cross between one of these Brewsters and uh, probably another golden wing or another blue wing warbler. I've only seen one. I saw it in Four Oaks Marsh a couple years ago. It's stunning. So what about the birds from the south? And if you can't identify, that's OK. I'm going to play this song. And remember, I'm not a videographer. Try not to get seasick, but I had a long lens in the dark woods and this is what right there, the pizza. This is an Acadian flycatcher. This was way up in northeastern Portage County in the Little Wolf River's fishery area. The Acadian flycatcher is one of the one of the definite indicators, benchmark species for a mature hardwood forest down in the southern parts uh, of the country. They're up here because the habitat is good. It's got a mature forest. And because once again, we're in the tension zone. So as we were in the southern edges of, say, the blue-headed vireos range, we are now in the northern edge of this guy's range. And they've bred, uh, we've had breeding records from the 
Tomorrow River Fisher and Hunting Grounds um, from the Dick Kemp area. So they're here. And the interesting thing about this bird is while I was trying to chase him around trying to get a video clip of the Acadian flycatcher in the background in the parking lot, I was listening to this bird. And that's the magic sound of a hermit thrush, a Northwoods bird in the same woodlot. Woodpecker. But the point here is this is what the tension zone gets you uh, for birds, and this is why we have such a nice number and a nice diversity. This this is definitely a southern bird who's moving north and taking advantage of the habitat here. This is a northern bird and finding the right habitat there in the hemlocks and the deep shaded woods. And there are other influences, other other indicators of, of birds that are at the northern edge of their of their breeding range. This is Cerulean warbler. This picture is an old picture. It was taken in 2006. Once again, in that northern area of the Richard Hemp Fisheries area, I don't know how many people know of the old Classics Farm at the dead end on River Road, but up behind his farm, there was a, a nice mature hardwood forest. And for a number of years, there was uh, a good population of Cerulean warblers breeding there. There was a select cut done and they moved out. But the interesting thing is now, the, the last few years, they're being heard and seen a little more regularly in the northeastern and down the eastern part of the county, actually almost down towards some of the uh, Ice Age Trail stuff close to Emmons, Emmons Creek. So they're still with us. And I think with a little more investigation, we may find that they're nesting again. Um, other birds, we're, we're kind of at the northern edge of the limit, surprisingly, is the red-shouldered hawk. We see them all the time. They're over at Iverson Park. They're along the uh, Plover River, up, up. This bird was up near the uh, Dick Hemp area again. And we're also near the northern edge of the um, uh, Eastern Screech Owl. This is a bird who's taking advantage of the Kessler boxes in Buena Vista. We're kind of on the edge of their range as well. They're, but they're moving up and they seem to be seen a little more common. Other birds, uh, blue gray net catcher. Don't think about them as, as anything but a local bird, but we are sitting pretty close. You get farther north, they become less and less. And it's a nice, nice river bottom species. Here's another bird that has come in to the state. This is an orchard oriole. And I, can, I can remember speaking with about Nancy Stevenson, uh, a good mutual friend of ours, uh, Vince High, in 2009 gave us a call saying he had uh, orchard orioles over by the dog park at Standing Rock. The next day, Nancy and I went out and met Vince there. And sure enough, there was a female building a nest, male singing away, and actually a first year male singing away. That was the first time I'd ever seen them. And that was, like I said, that was in 2009. They're becoming a little more common. Uh, Lost Creek has some orchard orioles and Buena Vista grass side is they're becoming very common in some of the wooded areas along the road down there. Other southern birds, another, once again, I'm back to Dick Hamp. This is a hooded warbler. They nested there for a number of years at the headwaters of Poncho Creek. Uh, select cut kind of moved them out. They like mature hardwood forests, and they like a well-developed understory, which is where they nest. And they were in there for a number of years. Uh, I like the cerulean. The neat thing is, this last year, I think there were more reports of hooded warblers being seen and heard in the county than, than I can ever remember. Once again, always over now over to the north and east, dropping down on the eastern edge, following again that curve, that edge of their northern edge of their breeding range. This is a tufted titmouse, a southern and western bird. Growing up, the only place you can see tufted titmouse that I knew about in the state was over by Eau Claire. Uh, now they've become a regular component of the bird life of Portage County, a southern bird pushing its limits, uh, uh, breeding limits. Other birds, we don't really think about the red-headed woodpecker as being a transition zone bird, but it really is. And I think most people know it's a bird of the, of the uh, open savanna, oak savanna. And uh, uh, to, uh, to their credit, the uh, aggressive uh, work in Schmeekly to get the Berard oak up and create a oak savanna there is paying off. These birds have showed up in the last couple of years. They are in the oak savanna in Schmeekly. It's pretty cool. They tend to show up wherever we're doing the breeding uh, atlas program, wherever there was a clear cut or a managed cut, like in, even up north into Torrin, off Torrin Road, where they're doing some oak management. Uh, as soon as they're done cutting, these birds were in there. I don't know where they came from, but they were there. Right now, the best place to see them is over on the Green Circle Trail, I think behind the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
just off the boardwalk on the uh, River Pines Trail. Uh, there's a good activity there. And there's still activity by the little pump house by the papers. This is a lark sparrow. This bird is trying to nest by the Ike Walton property. They like this blown out habitat. And they do show up in front of Vista Grassland as well. So it's a southern bird again, extending. We're, we're sitting at the edge of its range. I shouldn't even say extending because we don't know, but we're, we have that nice overlap. Here's two birds. If you can't tell them apart, don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> as of, and until 1973, you didn't have to be able to tell them apart. They were one species, the trail flycatcher. I use this one just because of what their, uh, their range maps, and how, how neat they are, and how they kind of make that whole point about the tension. Now, this is an alder flycatcher, this is a willow flycatcher. Uh, their songs separate them quite easily, but otherwise they're, they're an Pedernax flycatcher. It's kind of like the Acadian. Uh, their songs are hardwired, so when you hear one, you know one, but you have to hear one. And uh, just a little side, this is kind of cool. Uh, I like little stuff like this. These are molt bars, and they're day and night. It's like rings on a tree. That's all I can put them to molt the feather out. You can see those little bars. And you don't always see that. The light had to be just right. I thought it was kind of cool. Um, but here's their ranges. And... Uh, this is the alder flycatcher's range here, and there's that S curve, and, it, and it's so neat. And there's Portage County right in the center. Little flycatcher pushes up a little bit more. Um, there are places in the county where you can stand on a road and listen to an alder flycatcher on one side, the little flycatcher on the other, all depending on the habitat uh, that they need. But the habitat is much more common in the south. Um, these are some facultative migrants I thought I would throw in. Uh, these are birds who breed here, but not always, or that we can find here. Uh, it's kind of tension zone related, kind of not. Uh, <laughs> um, but these are migrants that will come in uh, for one reason or another, for food or to avoid uh, stresses, uh, just looking for habitat. The dick thistle, I think now, has become uh, a pretty regular component of the breeding birds of Portage County. It wasn't always that way. It's very recently become one that you can see regularly, especially in Buena Vista, but other parts of the state. Some areas are all over the place. They used to come up, uh, it was thought, based on either drought conditions, fires, or loss of habitat down in there in the central plains, and they would move up this way to breed. And I think there's a habit, great habitat loss in central plains and a, and a continuing drought, so we have them all the time. <coughs> I don't know if you can see this up here. That's the tail of a, of a pine siskin. That's at Erickson Natural Area in 2018. We had a winter with a lot of siskins, a lot of food. They hung around a little late. They just decided to nest. They don't always, but they are part, they are a component of the breeding birds of Portage County. And they're a northern bird that winds up, comes down as a, like I said, a facultative migrant, comes down for food, and then just stuck around. The crossbills will do the same thing. These are red crossbills in the road up by Lake Dubay by the dam. Uh, there's a lot of pine plantations there, and if there's good food, and they're hanging around, they will nest. There's also a population that that's, you can find occasionally nesting over by New Hope Pine. That, I think, is a transition impact. Uh, uh, white-winged crossbills will do the same thing. Uh, just to show how birds will move, these are from uh, Sam Robbins' book. These are the dates these birds were first seen in Portage County. This is a red-bellied woodpecker. Now they're, they're all over across the state, uh, the state and all the way across the county, and every year we're sending records on a Christmas bird count for red bellied woodpeckers and pretty tough to tip But cardinals before 1935, no cardinals. So this transition, this whole thing is a, is a, a, is a it's in flux. It's always changing and, and birds are moving. It's tough to tip mouse. This picture I took right behind the house. I used to live over by Shoney's or Connor for one subdivision. It's a fledgling. That was, uh, I think, five years ago. 1959, they first showed up. They're kind of slow movers, though. These guys have been all over the place we're in. So I wonder, you know, sometimes you wonder what's next as this, as this zone, this tension zone, as this habitat keeps moving. Uh, a year and a half ago, Rob Pendergast found the uh, Mel's Vireo singing, I'm assuming setting up, trying to set up territory in the Buena Vista grass. And the habitat's right, and it's not that far north. Uh, they didn't come back this year, but you know, keep watching. You don't know. I'm looking, eyes like looking for trends. Uh, this is the, uh, the old rest of chat. It was in my backyard again over by Shoney's. Uh, five years ago. Wouldn't thought much of it, except in 2009, there was a bird north of Mead Park that was on territory singing for most of the spring trying to attract the mate. He didn't succeed, but if he had, um, we might have a new breeding bird moving in too. But those are the trends. You see if this keeps happening. Rarities are some, usually something went wrong, and, and the bird is someplace where it doesn't belong, 
it doesn't, it, it's in trouble probably. <laughs> but when you start seeing them come in and try to set up a breeding territory and then go back because they're not successful, that I like to watch because that's, that's the change. That's the change in progress. But I have to say the tension zone alone isn't enough to explain the diversity we have here. Um, it, 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 it accounts for a lot, for a lot of our breeding stuff, these overlapping territories. But it's the special habitats that we have here that we've been really lucky to have that attracts a whole different community of resident and migrant birds that are coming through. Um, one of the things we have a lot of our lakes and lakes and rivers and rivers lead to foliages. And those provide great opportunities uh, in a lot of different ways, not just in waterfall. Um, they provide homes and opportunities for us to see bald eagles. Growing up near Lake Dubay and just over the border in American County, where the eagle plane comes in, there was never a time I didn't see bald eagles, even in the 70s when they were in trouble. So I, I don't get real excited about them sometimes, but they're pretty cool. This was this was at the uh, Lord um, Waiting Park by the Plover River. They're nesting there, and, we're, and as was this osprey, also nesting there uh, by Waiting uh, by the Waiting Park. We're pretty lucky that. We have nesting ospreys and eagles in town, around town, very accessible. We see them all the time. We see them all the time because of our rivers and our forages. Other river birds that we get to see, um, the belted kingfisher. Yeah, this was at, at McDill. And, uh, and one, of my, one of my favorite birds, this is a, a warbling vireo. And I, I just have a soft spot for birds. When you look in the field guide, their distinguishing, their distinguishing characteristic is the lack of distinguishing. And that's a lot for me. A beautiful song, a very persistent singer, by the way, but a, a real good indicator that you're in a river bottom habitat. Also, the blue grain hat catcher, this is at Galecki Park, a uh, good indicator following the river bottom, the so brushy, brushy edges. Also, the uh, American Red Star, nice male. This was at Jordan Park, down by the, uh, I think it's, I think it's a, a bridge for snow, but maybe that nice little arched bridge. There's a female so trying out a nest for size, building a nest, same place, right along the Plover River. And cedar waxwings as well. A lot of times people ask me where all the cedar waxwings go, what they see all winter, where do they go, where do they, where do they go in the summer? Go down by the rivers, they're here, they're still here yet. They change their diet from fruit to insects, and uh, they're very good fly catchers. And they, they work the hatches along the river. Well, this bird is actually gathering nestling material at the new, the new uh, green circle segment, that paper mill section. Other birds that like river bottoms and rivers for us, uh, yellow warblers, and uh, a bird that uh, I have to agree, my friend, uh, Ted Kyle, always wanted to change the name of this from uh, Cliff Swallow to Bridge Swallow. And he's probably right, that's where you find them. And we've got a lot of them in town, very common, beautiful bird. And one of the few, um, shorebirds that we can count on seeing that hang around here all summer in Portage County, a spotted sandpiper. This was um, at Jordan Park as well on, on the, by the lake. But we find ourselves in March. Soon we'll be listening to this. Not that they're only found along Lake Shore is <laughs> And, and, and wetlands, but that's usually the first place I hear them. And pretty soon, and maybe some people have already heard uh, the song sparrows that are returned, but we're right on the cusp of that. And what that makes me think of is migration and what these rivers and lakes mean for us for migration, because they've certainly seemed to funnel the birds in. Uh, these are neotropical migrants, these are warblers. I, I think probably they don't fly them as, as flyways the way waterfall do. I think most of the neotropical migrants, when they come across the country at night, they're coming across in a fairly broad front. But as daylight comes on and they start reorienting, migration is very energy intensive and you need a lot of water to burn all those calories. They start, I think they start looking for water systems. They start looking for rivers. They start looking for pathways that are heading north. And we have them on the Wisconsin River, uh, Plover River, Tomorrow River. This is a black and white warbler. This was down in a place called the Pipes, which is off Cashmere Road, just north of town, a river bottom. This bird here, bay-breasted warbler, not gonna nest here, he's on his way way up north. But this was by uh, the little park over by the spillway on the west side. I think what the rivers do is they provide an easier way for us to see the birds, not so much that the birds use it, and they do, 
but it gives us an opening. The birds are still migrating across the full canopy forest, but good luck seeing them, and they're not concentrated. But when you get near a river's edge, where they're coming down for water, they're coming down for food, the birds get concentrated in their perfect places to do some birding. This is a magnolia warbler at Jordan Park. This is a just outside of warbler and a uh, myrtle warbler, yellow rumped warbler. These are both on River Road, just below the Dubai Dam. This bird will nest there. These two are probably on their way north. Other birds uh, to see along the river. This was at Jordan Park. This was about three feet off the ground. A beautiful northern barrel warbler. Uh, this, this is an orange crown warbler, also at Jordan Park. Bay breasted warbler using that park over by the spillway again. Great places to see birds, to get beautiful looks. Orange crown warblers are one I think we need to kind of watch a little bit. Not that they will nest here, but uh, their numbers seem to be shifting uh, east. At least to me, anyway, I'm seeing them much more frequently than I used to. Kind of in the uh, west, west, all west are very, very common. And not everything that's up in the trees during migration are warblers. This is a wood duck and the male up in the trees following the female around. She's looking for a nest box, but I love how beautifully he matches the foliage. This is at Iverson Park. And there she is, and she's looking for a hole and she's hanging around. Uh, other ducks, this is at Lower Whiting Park, Black American black ducks, blue winged teal. Uh, this is a gadwall on McGill Pond. Uh, this mallard and this green winged teal pair were down in the, the little wetland area there, just, uh, just north of that little pump house on the Green Circle Trail. Once again, it's the flowages, it's the backwaters that bring us the opportunities to see these birds, most of them in migration. Winter time on the river, we get golden eyes, most of them are aware of that. Good place to watch behavior. It's something to do in a cold winter day. You don't want to watch the golden eyes because they're courting and there's a lot of stuff going on. And the mallards, of course, are with them. This is springtime on McGill Pond. These are migrant birds, northern shovelers all hauled up on the ice, green and teal. There's some ring neck ducks back there. You can see that little. White chevron that sets them off and some geese just hanging out on the ice, waiting around to keep migrating. On the Plover River, where the Plover River uh, empties into the Wisconsin River by the Nina Bill, uh, these are uh, common regansers. They'll stay with us all winter, as will the swan. This is a this is a trumpeter swan, and very commonly they stay all winter with us. This is uh, hanging out with a mute swan, which I thought was kind of interesting to see both swans together. Great place to go look for them though, along the river in the wintertime. And uh, this, this I had to show just because it's kind of cool. I remember my friend Stan Scuta gave me a call um, in April of 2013 and said, boy, there's a pile of ducks down here by the Clark Street Bridge. You got to come and see it. So I went driving over. And sure enough, these are these are a bunch of lesser scop. There's a bunch of other ducks. If you took a look to the right here, you'd be looking at the Clark Street Bridge. Uh, this was right over by the uh, Edgewater Manor. But the cool thing was these guys over here. These are American Avocets. And they're tired. <laughs> um, they're swimming around. They're shorebirds. They're more from out west. There's lots of them. We can see them often in Wisconsin. This was the coolest thing. Um, you can see these other birds swimming uh, are sleeping too. But they're this one all lazy on it. I mean, these birds were done. It was one of those springs when everything up north of us was frozen, and the birds were trying to find some place to sit down. And you can see there was quite a slug of them. All these are sleeping. All the right in the close. A lot of the ducks are sleeping. There's some buffalo head back there. Coots. It was, a, it was an amazing sight. <clears throat> and the rivers, of course, give us some flowages. There's some good flowages on the river. Stevens Point uh, flowage is good. Second Lake is good. But this, this, is, this is one of the favorites. And this has provided us with some great opportunities to see birds that don't normally come this far inland. This, of course, is a uh, dike on Lake Dubay, <clears throat> looking west towards County Highway. I'm not really sure what these guys are looking at because everything is going on on the other side of them. If they just stuck their head over like I did, they would have found themselves with a good day on Lake Dubay. Not always like this is the spring. Just over the night. Greenland teal, there's some green neck ducks, and now it's black ducks. Uh, more scop and green neck ducks. And darn it, it's another day when you got to share the night. Not always like that. This is what it's like in the wintertime quite often. The only good thing here is there's no wind. The bad thing with no wind is you got to put up with the morning fog. Uh, it gets very cold. A lot of days are like this. Dubai has, is, has some really, really quiet days when it's cold to get there early in the way around. And as the fog clears, 
uh, if, if it's a decent day, you'll have a half a dozen divers. These are probably Lester Scott and something else back out there. You have to wait for some more of the mist to clear, but this is the view from the dike. But some days, Dubai can be very good indeed. Uh, there's probably four or five species that are flying, uh, probably late October morning. Uh, there's probably half a dozen days like this in the fall, and it can be very, very good. Most of these birds that are in the flight are these guys. These are lesser scop. Uh, this is a pretty good look at them. You don't usually get that. Not much of a black tip on the tail, like a little notch head, kind of a purple sheen, which separates them from the greater scop. In flight, they're very easy to tell. The uh, lesser scop has a white, I can kind of show you, but this secondary, the lining on the secondary is just white, but it stops before it gets to the primary. It's easier when you see it than to be described to it. The other bird is the greater scalp where it's white. All the wing lining is white all the way out to the primaries. Um, he's got a heavier nail, more of a rounded head, and a greenish tint, which you almost never see. And the picture picked, pulled it out really nice this time. This, this bird likes big water, which is why it shows up on Dubai. Uh, lesser scalp. Um, ponds, farm ponds, and, and puddle holes, and things like that. These are probably more common than we used to think, because they show up on Dubai fairly regularly. You usually pick a few out. Uh, you go to the Great Lakes, there's lots of them. Other ducks on Dubai, um, the green neck ducks, once again, that little white, that little white clips there, the green teal. Yes, there are two, nobody else has a green head. Sleeping on the ice, this is a spring duck. And I never used to think much. Uh, I used to get pretty excited seeing ruddy ducks, so I started going to Lake Dubay in the fall, and you can see hundreds of them uh, coming through in migration. Uh, there's some buffalo heads, uh, there's some red heads on focus in the background. Uh, this guy is a uh, hooded merganser, just showing off, uh, swimming around. This, of course, is in the springtime. Uh, we get loons, spring loons. Uh, and also in the fall, they come through. The thing I would say if you want to see loons is be there before the sun comes up. They are diurnal migrants, and they will fly all day, they'll sit down late in the evening, rest on Dubai, and a lot of times by sunrise, they're picked up and gone. You get there at 10 o'clock and wonder what all the excitement is about. Um, as the season wears on, thunderstorms drop into the lake and, and on the river in general. And here the gold mines are showing up. You know the season has advanced. Uh, we also get grebes, there's a horn grebe. And we have had a couple of instances with some really nice looks at your grebe. This is the western grebe um, that shows up here because we have these big flows. And also because we have these big foliages, as you get in November when it gets really cold, uh, we typically will have days, if you're there that day, when you bring uh, the long-tailed ducks show up, beautiful birds, northern birds, much more common on the Great Lakes, but we get some because we have big foliages. Uh, scoters as well, all three scoters have been seen on Dubai. This happens to be a white-winged scoter, but black scoters are here, and surf scoters, there's our golden eye telling you, that's probably November. Uh, this is a long-tailed duck, uh, which was found uh, somebody spotted it just along West River Drive and hung around for a while feeding uh, crayfish and crustaceans off the bottom of the river. And on Dubai as well, as you get into where there's snow on there and it's getting very cold, that's a good place to see snow buttons. They'll you know, show up and feed on the weed seeds. And the season is about over. Uh, another great habitat that we have are our wetlands and marshes. We don't have a lot, but what we have is good quality. There's a nice little one. Um, we call it Bear Creek Marsh. It's on County Highway I between Double P and County C. Uh, you can park on Marsh Road and see it. It's not real big, but it's high quality. You can see a lot of good stuff. Uh, or you can walk into Four Oaks Marsh. This is in the Mead. This is the northwest corner of Portage County. It's a bit of a walk in, but it's worth it. And you go through some beautiful habitat on the way in, uh, good mixed habitat. Like I said, that's where I saw that, uh, uh, the, the hybrid warblers in there. Uh, when you get to Four Oaks, this is what you can find. I and mean, this is the marsh itself. It's a small corner of marsh. It's got the great blue herons, so you can see the sandhill cranes. And whooping cranes have been hanging around the last few years, uh, moving between that and across the border into Maryland County. Um, it's a great place to see black terns, probably the best place in the county I know of to see black terns. They don't nest there, but they nest just, just across the county line into Maryland County on South uh, Down Line, Florida. Good place to see American bitterns. American bitterns will be seen in any of the wetlands in the county. This one is kind of trying to hide before the grass is grown up high enough to hide them, but instincts are instincts. And, uh, it provided me with a great opportunity. Green herons, all of them. A nice bird. Any good wetland is going to have green herons. Farm ponds have green herons and a great bird. Fun to watch. <clears throat> Other wetland birds common to all our wetlands that we have because of the wetlands, but 
by the common yellow throat, swamp sparrows, uh, northern harriers. And one of the other wetlands, I wanted to show you this just quickly. Uh, this is Lost Creek. Lost Creek was uh, started construction on it in 2009, 2010. And I made this video in 2011 on April 18th just to show you what it kind of was like and why people were getting really excited about it. Um, this was taken right off up to LA to stand on the road. And it but this is what we used to see for a couple of years. I wasn't, I wasn't intended to stay this way, but it was full of snow. It was full of thunder swans. these trees. These trees were planted. This was also supposed to be a mitigation site for um, some river uh, of uh, So it was never intended to stay like this, but it sure was exciting when we watched. The water is still there. Ducks still come in, but you can't see them anything like you can here. I like people to see this because this is kind of a little piece of Portage County history. It has grown up quite a bit. These are other birds, though. These still come through uh, Lost Creek, and you can still see them a good number. These guys still nest. They're pied billed grebes. Uh, northern shovelers come in in migration. This bird also in migration. This is a great egret. You can tell us it's taken in the spring because he still has that green patch. Uh, colors up a little bit for breeding. It has become a really, really great uh, place to see rails. Uh, Virginia rails, soar rails. Probably the best place I know to see them. American, or American coots now, <clears throat> now nest there, which is unusual. And 2012, these guys showed up. And this is a pretty cool bird. This is a transition bird again. You hear the marsh sounds in the background. Marsh ran there. That's a common gallon, though, and that, of course, is a breeding record for Clark County. Or it doesn't give you a great look, but I love the you know, little ones come out. They still show up. They're hard to see. You know, the marsh has really grown up. Still have common gallon. This is pretty exciting. I drop on these two. Other marsh birds are common to all marshes. Uh, Wilson's um, Wilson snipe, the uh, marsh wren, and sandhill crane. These are common also to all of our all of our wetland habitats. And I wanted to show this because another change in habitat. The Lost Creek was first completed and it grew up. We had great habitat for yellow headed blackbirds. And they were here and then they went. <laughs> it grew up too much. They like deep water and they like clumps of cattails around. They would actually outcompete uh, red, red winged blackbirds for nesting habitat, but the habitat got too thick and it wasn't, so they left. But they did breed there for a couple of years. The other nice thing about Lost Creek that gives it a nice high species count is the brushy margins on the north or the south end rather of the uh, of the property it's a great hedgerow in migration you can find ruby crown kinglets uh great catbirds nests there <clears throat> and also here again is our friend the orchard oriole which are have bred there have been there are, are seen there regularly into the fall it's a great space for sparrows here we have a harris's sparrow white throat sparrow and, and white crown sparrow all in migration these are three of the Four is one of the trickiest sparrows in North America, if you like to say zone of trickia. Um, but they're found at, at Lost Creek and a lot of other sparrows. There are records uh, for the Kant sparrows. There are savanna sparrows. There are clay colored sparrows. Uh, lots of swamp sparrows. There are lots of song sparrows. Tree sparrows in the wintertime. Uh, there are records of Nelson sparrow, you coming through there in migration, Lincoln sparrows in migration, uh, long spurs. Uh, it's, a, it's a great spot to just keep visiting because it changes all the time. Shorebirds are there, not so much. Lesser yellowlegs are there because they don't mind the grassy grown up kind of a marsh, so they'll use it. Uh, killdeer are there all the time. And this one is nesting around in the road, so you kind of have to watch. They love the small gravel stones along the road. This one's an animal stone on the road. The first few years when the marsh was still fairly open, Wilson's fell ropes nested there. They don't anymore. But if there's good water, we have nesting. Uh, Fowl ropes, not Wilson Stalls, up in um, Dewey Marsh, and what we call the Philippine Islands. Shorebirds do show up, and if you look at this, this is, this is a Hudsonian goblet that showed up, but it's, what's important about this picture is the water behind them. This is on the sod farm, which is just, just a little bit north and over from Lost Creek. It's uh, 
green turf, green metal turf park. When we get a lot of rain, it doesn't drain off fast. It, it takes a while. So we, we have this ephemeral habitat that shows up. So we get big rains, everybody goes, if you think of it, to get out there and see. The shorebirds, for some reason, show up. Um, if they're flying over or whatever they drop in. So sometimes we have really good shorebird habitat, but nothing you can count on. What you can count on are these birds, which we'll use the sod farm regardless whether there's a lot of rain or not. These are buff breasted sandpipers, and this is the American Golden Plover. These guys are long distance migrants. We're really lucky because we have this habitat, we have the sod farm, we get to see buff breasted sandpiper on their way to the poppers of South America. The third good habitat I'll cover kind of quickly. Um, our grassland habitats, which a lot of us are familiar with. This is coming up on our field trip, by the way. This is a sunrise on Buena Vista. You can see it's kind of frosty and chilly. Uh, there's patches of grassland all over the county, uh, up along the western edge, especially up in up towards Mead, a lot of old fields, hay fields, Paul Jails, and all that area is over there near Millador. But if you want, like I said, if you want a good feel for what it's like to be on an open prairie, not prairie, but open grassland, I should say, uh, is go down south of Clover and uh, west of I-39 to the Buena Vista grassland. It, it's probably, it says if it's one of, it's probably the largest publicly accessible grassland east of the Mississippi River. And this is where we come into where I said there's probably one bird species, which is almost an endemic to the county, uh, not entirely, but pretty close. And that would be, of course, the, the uh, greater prairie chicken. And there's a prairie chicken management sign that's what you're looking for. This is kind of what Buena Vista looks like off Swamp Road, you know, this time of the year, probably. But this is a great prairie chicken, and this is also the only bird image in this whole presentation that I did not take. I don't have uh, what I consider a nice image, of, uh, especially a male uh, greater prairie chicken displaying. This is courtesy of these birds. Very nice. That's what they look like, and that's probably starting to go on right now, and it'll continue right up into May. The booming and the dancing excitement. It's pretty. It's pretty cool, and they are the umbrella species for all the other birds, the grassland birds that are living out in. Uh, the Buena Vista, that's, yeah, we're pretty lucky that we have these guys because that's what keeps that habitat going. <clears throat> and as I said, it's got 240 species have been listed on eBird. Uh, clay colored sparrows, there's grasshopper sparrows, savanna sparrows, uh, all singing uh, this time of the year. Now, as it warms up, as more birds show up, it gets better and better. As a Hensel sparrow, straight threatened species, Vesper sparrow. Uh, kind of a plain, over, easily overlooked sparrow. Beautiful song. A lot of times you're wondering what that is singing. It turns out to be this grab a little sparrow sitting in the edges. I think this is probably an Eastern Meadowlark. Don't quote me on that. I can't hear the song, but normally Eastern would have a little more yellow coming off the Meadowlark uh, in the Western wood, and it wouldn't have quite as detail, as detail in the head, but yeah, I said, no, don't take the corner of that one. Other great birds in the grassland, of course, our dick thistles are nesting there now. And these two birds I just put in, this house wren and the eastern kingbird, because the, the hedgerows and the, and the brushy margins on some of the old fields, particularly along um, all, a couple of the older roads, in, in like Town Line Road, are so important to these birds for habitat. Uh, breeding, there's yellow warblers in there, and there are um, uh, warbling various hang around there. The orchard orioles hang around these brushy margins, these edges, which you know, just great habitat. In the grass, I think one of these stuff. Um, Bob Link, everybody should recognize this. I still don't have a, a recording of a song. I should. It's very exciting. It's very interesting. Here's a male of breeding plumage, a male who's starting to molt, a uh, female. Eventually, they'll all look like this before the end of the summer, and they head south early. And once again, these guys are going down to Argentina. They're a long distance fire. Um, and one of the reasons I changed my thing or my uh, word when I talked about a prairie and called it a grassland. I'm surprised how many of my photographs when I look at my grassland birds are sitting on spotted nest. Uh, it's a grassland, it's not a prairie. Other good birds down there are, and that people sometimes overlook are brewers, blackbirds. This is a grassland special, a really neat bird. You see it, you know, you're in open grassland country. There's cattle around. Same thing with brown headed culver. This is where they belong. Uh, they live in the open country, following the cows around. This is a particularly beautiful bird, so I have to in there. And I know the sign says prairie chicken is not a prairie chicken. Uh, it is an upland sandpiper. This is another one of those benchmark species uh, of quality grassland habitat. And they're on a the decline. Uh, they used to be much more common in the county. I know I, I took over a, a breeding bird survey route from Nancy Stevenson years ago. It went all the way up uh, County Essen on the western part of the county. And they were pretty common in, in a few spots when you got towards Millard, not so much anymore. 
And I put this picture in just because I want everybody to know that not everything that stands on a telephone pole in Buena Vista is a snow hill. Um, they like to stand on wires, they like to stand on poles. Other birds in the grassland, again, our friend of Wilson Snipe, that's her yellow legs. Uh, the, the shorebird habitat there typically is a sheet water habitat, water that doesn't melt off. The standing water takes a while to drain off. And uh, we get good shorebird habitat, but it doesn't last long and it's not very predictable. Uh, they'll usually always kill deer around. This I threw in, this was an old picture as well, probably from around 2007 or eight. The South uh, W Pond, there's two W Ponds, by the way. One you can see from County W right near where the Cranberry uh, Farm is. But behind that's another one. Before it was all a big, huge cornfield, there was a great uh, hedgerow that ran along that. And it was all pasture. There was a couple of mules and I think an old draft horse that were pastured there. There was no corn. And we had access to it. The farmer didn't, didn't mind. Uh, it's all leased now for duck hunting, so it's kind of off limits. It's too bad because it could get very good there. Uh, but that's the place that uh, we don't go anymore. But you get good habitat just watching for where the water is, standing water is going to just the shorebirds will use it. And of course, Buena Vista is sandhill cranes. And there's the three of them here walking across. This is off the swamp pro. If you look at this little guy there following along behind. Some more of the main attractions. <laughs> People go to Buena Vista because they want to see raptors. Here, these, these are short-eared owls. Short-eared owls will nest there if the rodent population is high enough. They don't always nest. It's not predictable, but they do always migrate through it. So this time of the year um, it, and coming up now into late March, early April is a good time. Uh, sunrise, sunset to try to see uh, short-eared owls in migration. Beautiful bird, great neat flyer, big giant moths flying across on your grassland. Other raptors that are, are visible like to see are near the, the uh, American Kestrel, and that's, that was mentioned that uh, Amber and Janet Eschenbach are uh, running the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Kestrel, the Central Wisconsin Kestrel Research Project, I'm sorry, and uh, it's, a, it's a route, it's a, uh, a nesting route that goes back to uh, Francis Hammerstone actually started it, so it's got a good history behind it. So when you see the boxes on the poles out there that look like uh, wood duck boxes, they're actually kestrel boxes. And it's a very long running program. It's a beautiful male here. There's also uh, red tail hawks and northern harriers, common, common raptors of the grassland. And as the season winds down, as we come through sun and the fall, we start seeing frost on the grass. You start looking for these guys, the rough legged hawks. They've come down from the Arctic. They're lemming eaters. They have lovely feet. Uh, this is a lot like their habitat where they live normally. So they like to settle into Buena Vista. If the rodent population is good, they'll stick around in big numbers all winter. If not, uh, they can go there. Other northern raptors to look for, uh, northern shrikes spend their winters here. There's a frosty uh, merlin. Uh, and throw his red tail in. Red tails are there all year round. This was on County F, just kind of hunting them, uh, how to put them in the show. But this is a, another one of those benchmarks. This is what people love to go to Buena Vista for and ride around and look for, of course, snowy owls. This one on a telephone pole. I put these in because these are birds that aren't on a telephone pole. Uh, they're interesting birds and they are quite an attraction. And we're, and we're fortunate again because we have the grassland habitat, we get snowy owls. And pretty regularly, some years more than others, there's some debate about what brings them down, whether it's the food, uh, whether it's an excessive uh, hatch year. Not really sure. There are some people, uh, I remember talking with Kent, he knew some friends of his that banded snowy owls in the Dakotas, and they caught the same female seven years in a row in the same place, the same territory, which she would come in and defend. Their conclusion was that snowy owls, at least some of them, are migratory, and this part, these parts of Wisconsin and the Great Plains are part of their winter range, and so they, of course they show up, and they just come down and they go back. They're, they're not in stress, but that's, that's debatable yet, but it's fun to see them. But don't forget about the other great winter birds in Buena Vista. This was a red pole year. I think a lot of people can attest to that. On a weekend, we had hordes of red poles in the yard. Uh, right now, they're out in the weed seeds. They, they really take advantage of the grassland. Uh, also, American tree sparrows do the same thing. The little flocks, these guys bustling about on the roadside, especially in more wooded areas and twiggy or stuff. Great other winter birds. This is the Lapland longspur winter plumage. Uh, some snow buntings hanging on the ditch. And now the horned larks have come back. Some horned larks stick around all winter, but now they're passing through. Most of them are heading north. They have nested in the grassland. 
So that kind of is the second key to why birding here is so good. It's, it's habitat. We're really lucky to have these big rivers, the lakes, the marshes, and, uh, and, and, and the third key, you know, with that, with the first key, of course, that we have, uh, lucky enough to be in the middle of the tension zone. But the third key is, is, is here. It's wrapped up in this. It's access. We have good access to all these places. All these pictures I've shown you, except for the one, the one of the, uh, of the shorebirds, we're all public, public land, public accessible land. Um, there's old back roads you can walk and look at the place. There's lots of these public hunting and fishing grounds. This is up by Big Town, the Swan Smile River, Poncho Creek, Flume Creek has some areas like this, Little Wolf River fisheries there, with trails, and they're usually marked from Alcor Oshel properties. Uh, there are state natural areas all over the place. This is a particularly wonderful thing here in the Green Circle Trail, which provides great access to some of the best habitat around town and in the county. This, of course, the kiosk on, on Buena Vista, which explains the whole history of the grassland. And this place, 12,000 acres, public land. Great maps, you find yourself around. This Portage County, this is Steinhagen, one of the newer ones, but there's a lot of Portage County parks and access. Ice Age Trail goes through some beautiful habitat, beautiful burning places. Here's another map, this is the Richard Hemp Fisheries area. Uh, County Z is this uh, Pontchartrain Creek, Toronto River. Uh, this is a DNR map. This, this, the purple shows you the public areas, public access places, parks, the standing rocks. Uh, they're all where you want to be. They're along the rivers, they're along the flowages, Iverson Park, Jordan Park, uh, Erickson Natural Area. So I, I still think the third key to why birding in Portage County is so good is the great access that we have. And, and it's easy to get to these places. It's easy to negotiate using have nice trails. I remember being at Jordan Park where I was running into a photographer friend of mine, and he was talking about, well, isn't this nice here, you know, you know birding here in Jordan Park? I said, yeah, it really is. They even cut the grass. For us. <laughs> it's, really, it's really nice. So I'd like to thank everybody for watching. It got a little long-winded, but not too bad. Uh, sometimes people talk to me, uh, ask me about where to go, and, and ask me about uh, birds they've seen, and they're always kind of apologetic because, oh, you know, I'm not a real good birder. And I, you know, and, and I, I, it bothers me because uh, we're all we're all good birders. And I, I remember this quote. This is from Ken Kaufman's book, Field Guide to Advanced Birding. I recommend this book. It's great, especially the first couple of chapters. He just covers the whole, all the aspects of, of this birding business that we do. But I like the quote from that book. I think this applies to all of us. He says, as long as you're not causing serious disturbance to the birds, their habitat, or other people, there's no wrong way to go birding. Birding is something we do for enjoyment. So if you enjoy it, you're a good birder. And if you enjoy it a lot, you're a great birder. And I'd like to thank everybody for watching. Wow, if there was an applause, Jerry, right now, I think you would be getting a great applause. <laughs> that was really wonderful, Jerry. I feel like I've been given a tour of my hometown and um, just wonderful to see all those birds and knowing more where to go. So, well, I, I have I have more if people want to know. <laughs> I kind of okay. uh, trimmed it down a little bit. I didn't know if there were any questions. And if somebody had that question, I was ready for it. <laughs> so if, if um, so know, far, no. So far, I don't see questions yet. But if you have any okay, questions for Jerry, get those in to the chat. Or you can um, raise your, oh, there you go, Ann. Why don't you go ahead and ask your question there? Oh, um, we moved in here like uh, 19 years ago. And I didn't see at first um, the rufous sided towhees and the um, wood, the wood, I think it was the wood thrush, the one with the really pretty song. But now the last couple of years, I just see them constantly and I hear them just all the time when I walk down my road. <laughs> that's great. I don't know if that's just something I noticed or if they actually moved in here more. Depends. The habitat changes, they'll use it more, and, and it might be something that you're just more attuned to, and so you're picking up on it. Um, sometimes, especially like the wood thrush, as the woods get, you know, we've been here 19 years, as the woods get a little older, it's much more attractive to them to come in. And on the opposite side of that, the roof decided towies would like it if somebody's been doing some brush trimming and some cutting and it's grown in real <laughs> thick, and you've got some, some low brush areas that will pull in the roof decided towies. 
but they're both great birds, very flashy and fun to see, and especially the wood thrush's song is incredible. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I've ever seen one of those, but I hear them. They're just yeah, yeah, off in the woods common. and I can't find them. <laughs> that's pretty common. Most times you'll hear them, like a lot of the woodland birds, open birds and things like that. They're often heard seldom seen. <laughs> well, I don't see any questions either, Jerry. If this doesn't get people ready for spring, I'm not sure what it will take, but this was so exciting. Um, I'm so excited to probably sign up for some of these field trips that I really yeah. haven't gotten up early for. <laughs> yeah, that's where you find these places. You got to come along. <laughs> I know, you know, I started and then it kind of died off and it's time, isn't it? So you've got me so excited and motivated. Um, Ned, um, what does it become? Oh, what does it take to become an advanced birder? <laughs> <laughs> he asked. Oh. I think it's kind of tongue and tongue in cheek question he's asking. If I'm if I know Ned well, <laughs> I, I hope so. Um, I hope so. I try to hold on to that beginner thing as much as I can. I I I've never I, I never stopped learning things, and I I always to tell people that work. That it's too bad. I'm just not going to live long enough to use all this knowledge I'm getting. It just keeps coming in. So, <laughs> uh, the way to become advanced, and, and I know you're you're kind of kidding, but. Just, just do what you love. And if you love watching the birds and and, and finding a, a sit spot or someplace where you just sit and can watch the behavior of a particular bird, you'll learn so much more, I think, than, than chasing around from one spot to another. They're, they're, that's fine and it's fun to do. But to really get good at, I think you really have to sit down and just see what they're doing and, and watch for these. People used to tell me if you're, if you're bored and you're looking at morning doves, try to find something on a morning dove that you've never noticed before. Mm -hmm. Look at it that close and tell it, and that's that's how you get really good at it. Yeah, very. Well, very. while we still have everyone here, let me repeat the dates for those field trips. I hope everyone is feeling very enthused. That's March twenty sixth, the field trip to Shiocton, and April sixteenth is sunrise on the Buena Vista. Both uh, trips will be well worth your time, as you can see <laughs> tonight. Well, thanks again, Jerry. We really appreciate it. Excellent presentation and everybody happy spring birding as the birds um, have come back and are, are here. So have a good night. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everybody. Thank you. Great program, Jerry. Thanks, Ned. Yep, you've got a, night, a few kudos there. Um,